Snow crunches under boots. The teepee stands alone in the white forest. The thermometer reads minus 20. Inside, the air bites like knives. Most people at this temperature trust their furnace burning fuel all night just to keep the basement from freezing. But in this canvas cone, we tested seven heating tricks. Tricks that not only worked, they beat the furnace at its own game. We measured every change, numbers on the dial, logs consumed, hours of warmth gained. And while the flames flickered, we remembered the Sami of the far north, the Plains tribes of America, the Slavs with clay and straw, the Koreans with ondol floors. Every culture carried secrets for surviving cold. Stay with me, because the first trick alone Raise the temperature 12 degrees in 15 minutes. The first trick is the oldest one. A fire pit right in the heart of the teepee. Flames rising sparks drifting into the smoke hole above. Simple, but deadly effective when paired with a secret reflector walls. We built a ring of stones and stacked wooden planks behind the fire. Not just to block the wind, but to throw the heat back into the living space like a mirror made of earth and timber. Within 15 minutes, the thermometer jumped 12 degrees from bone-aching cold to something the hands could actually trust. This wasn't our invention. The Plains tribes used stone and hide to capture every ounce of heat. Far north Inuit and Eskimo shaped walls of snow and ice that worked the same way. Different worlds, same principle, control the radiant heat, and you survive. Now here's the catch. Many folks believe any stone will do. That's a myth. River rock, smooth and tempting, can explode in fire like a grenade. I've seen its shards flying louder than a shotgun. The safe choice is dry stone baked in the sun or preheated carefully at the edge of the fire before placing close. It's rough science, but it works. Reflect, retain, and redirect. The furnace in your house burns all night to achieve the same. Here, with nothing more than firestone and wood, the tippy kept pace. And this was just the beginning. The second trick was less obvious, but it worked like magic. We heated stones directly in the fire, not just for cooking, not just for light. These rocks became batteries storing heat, then slowly bleeding it out beneath the floor. We dug a shallow bed in the tippy, lined it with sand, dropped in the hot stones, and covered them again. No flames, no smoke, just a hidden warmth rising through the ground. The thermometer told the story the floor climbed eight degrees, and it stayed warm for six hours straight. Imagine that six hours of steady heat, even while the fire died down. This principle isn't new. In Korea, the Ondol floor carried smoke under stone slabs warming entire homes. In Russia, the massive brick stoves kept peasants alive through brutal winters, the bricks glowing with stored heat. Different continents, same solution turned stone into a slow-burning furnace. But there's a warning. Wet rock is dangerous. Trapped water turns to steam and the stone can burst like shrapnel. Only use dry stones preheated carefully. And because buried heat can still leak carbon monoxide from stray embers, we always cracked the tippy open, letting fresh air flow. Safety first. Always. So, here we had it. An underground fire silent and invisible yet powerful. A trick that stretched our fuel gave our backs relief from the frozen ground and proved one thing. The ancients were engineers long before the word existed. The third trick was all about direction. Fire gives light. Fire gives heat. But half that heat vanishes into smoke drifting into the night sky. So we asked, what if we could turn it back? We built a shield. A simple wall of birch bark sheets stretched tight, angled behind the fire. Thin but shiny. In another test, we used a panel of metal scrap. Either way, the effect was the same heat that once escaped now bounced straight into the sleeping zone. Within minutes, the thermometer near the bedroll crept up 5 degrees. 5 degrees doesn't sound like much, but at minus 20, that difference is the line between comfort and teeth chattering. This method reaches back centuries. 
The Sami herders of Scandinavia would pile snow in half circles, turning icy walls into reflectors. Vikings set up shields, literally shields, to bounce heat while they camped on frozen ground. Snow bark steel, different materials, same principle, reflect the flame, save the body. And here's the bonus. The shield redirected not only heat, but also smoke. Instead of curling down into the tippy, much of it lifted through the smoke hole. Cleaner air, clearer eyes, longer sleep. Some say only heavy stone works for reflection. Wrong. Even thin birch, even salvaged metal buys you comfort when used smart. This was proof. Five degrees less smoke, better rest. And yet, compared to what came next, this was just a small taste. The fourth trick looked ordinary. Just a cast iron pot hanging above the flames. But inside, we filled it with water. Slowly, as the fire licked the metal, the pot began to breathe, steam rising warmth spreading outward in every direction. It wasn't a sudden blast of heat. It was steady, gentle. The thermometer climbed little by little until the sleeping space gained a few degrees. More important, the air no longer felt bone dry. In deep winter, wood fire alone can parch your skin, split your lips. The steam softened it, balanced it. This idea echoes across history. In northern China, families hung water pots above their kang, the heated brick bed to keep both warmth and humidity through the night. Generations learned that comfort was not just heat, but the quality of air you breathed while sleeping. And in our tippy, it worked the same. A slow rise, a stable glow, nothing dramatic but reliable like a heartbeat of warmth above the fire. Yet there's danger here. Boiling water is no friend to children or tired hands reaching too close. A tipped pot can scald. A spill can snuff the fire or worse, burn flesh. Safety first, hang it strong, secure it well, keep it out of reach. So hack four proves something simple. Sometimes survival isn't about more flame. It's about shaping the fire's gift, turning harsh heat into a softer, lasting comfort. The fifth trick wasn't about fire at all. It was about keeping what we already had. Heat is like water. It leaks through every crack, every seam, every breath of wind. So we wrapped the tippy in layers. We hung heavy hides, draped woolen blankets, even stretched old oil cloth where the draft crept in. The effect was immediate. The thermometer showed the air inside holding steady 25 degrees warmer than outside. And when we counted the wood pile later, we realized nearly 30% less wood burn that night. Less cutting, less hauling, more rest. This idea runs deep in history. The tribes of North America piled extra skins in winter layering buffalo hide over their lodges. In the Slavic villages, peasants wove mats of straw, pressed them against log walls, or packed snow itself as a shield. Primitive, maybe. Effective, absolutely. Insulation is the invisible warrior. You don't notice it working until you step out into the night and feel the bite return. Then you know the walls held the warmth prisoner. Some people think fire alone is enough. Wrong. Fire gives the heat, but insulation decides how long you keep it. Without layers, you're chasing sparks. With them, you're banking hours of comfort. So hack five was simple but powerful. Not more flame. Not more smoke just smarter walls. And when we saw the woodpile untouched, we knew survival is as much about saving energy as it is about making it. The sixth trick felt almost childish at first, like building a fort inside a fort. We pitched a second tippy, smaller, tucked inside the first. Two cones of canvas, one wrapped around the other, with nothing but air caught between. And yet... That thin layer of trapped air worked like a blanket. The thermometer near the sleeping ground leapt 15 degrees higher. The firewood stack lasted longer too. Flames burned slower, steadier, because less heat escaped into the icy dark. This wasn't a new idea. The Mongols raised their yurts with felt layers, sometimes double-walled, holding warmth across endless steppe nights. Russian peasants built the izba with thick log walls, then stuffed moss, or even added inner walls, doubling the barrier against winter. Across the world, people learn the same lesson air itself when captured becomes armor. But there's a warning here. 
Two walls, tighter space smoke can linger. Carbon monoxide doesn't care about clever design. So we kept the vent open, checked the draft, watched the flame. Safety first. Always. In practice, the double tippy felt different. The outer skin took the brunt of the wind. Inside, the air stilled. Silence, warmth, and the kind of calm that makes you forget the storm outside. Some might laugh at the effort two tenths instead of one. But when your breath no longer freezes mid-air when your back meets warmth instead of frost, you realize it isn't childish at all. It's survival. The seventh trick looked humble. Just a clay pot turned upside down. Beneath it, a small flame, sometimes a candle, sometimes a tiny gas burner. At first glance, it feels too simple, almost foolish. But the test told another story. We set it beside the sleeping space with the main fire reduced to embers. Slowly, the pot absorbed the heat, then radiated it outward like a miniature stove. The thermometer showed a gain of 6 to 7 degrees in the sleeping zone. Not a furnace, not a roaring blaze, but in the dark hours when the main fire fades, that little clay dome bought us comfort. This hack is modern born from prepper circles, but its roots run deeper. Slavic villages relied on thick ceramic stoves glowing long after flames died. In Japan, the hibachi small clay and metal braziers warmed hands and spirits through long winters. What we tested was a marriage of old and new. Still, danger walks hand in hand with fire. Carbon monoxide is invisible merciless. That's why we say it plain never run this trick in a sealed space. Always crack a vent. Always use a CO detector. Survival means nothing if safety is ignored. So hack seven, close the circle. A humble pot. A hidden flame. A final proof that warmth isn't always about big fires. It's about clever ways to stretch the heat you already have. Now before we close, let's kill a couple of myths. Because cold is harsh, but bad information can be deadlier. First, river stones. Many folks believe they're safe. Smooth, round, perfect for a fire pit. Wrong. I've seen one explode like a grenade shards flying through the dark. The truth, water hides inside those stones. Heat turns it to steam. Pressure builds. And then bang. If you must use stone, choose dry, sun-baked rock. Heat it slowly at the fire's edge before trusting it near the flames. Second candles inside a tent. They're harmless, some say. No. Carbon monoxide is invisible, silent, merciless. It builds up without warning. One breath too many and you never wake. If you ever test hacks like the clay pot heater, keep a vent cracked. Always, always run a CO detector. And there are three anchors we never skip. Keep the smoke hole open, carry a carbon monoxide alarm, and yes, have a fire extinguisher within reach. A tippy in flames is faster than you think. The old ways taught us clever tricks, but wisdom also means respect. Respect the fire, respect the air, because survival is never just about warmth. It's about living to see the next dawn. When all seven hacks were done, we checked the numbers. Outside, the forest held steady at minus 20. Inside the teepee, the thermometer climbed from minus 20 to plus 45. And it did that with less than one-third of the firewood. A furnace would have burned overnight. That moment told us something powerful. Fire alone wasn't the answer. The answer was wisdom, how you shape the flame, how you trap the heat, how you live with the cold. And that wisdom wasn't ours. It came from the Sami in the far north, from the Slavs in their timber houses, from the Plains tribes, from the Asians with Kang floors and hibachi stoves. Across continents, across centuries, people left us a library of survival. In this tippy, all those voices met. So here's my ask. Share your hacks. Pass down what your grandfather taught, what you tested in your own backyard. And above all, keep your family safe. Because survival isn't just about heat, it's about coming home alive.